Welcome to Fault Injection. I'm Robert Vimosi, CISSP and Security Strategist at Synopsys, and I'm here at Black Hat USA 2017. My co-host, Chris Clark, is en route to Black Hat, and so today I'm going to be doing it solo. My guest today is Kevin Mitnick, world's Hello, greatest everybody. hacker, and uh, I just happened to have written a book last year with him, uh, Art of Invisibility. It's doing very well, thank you. Yeah, right. yes. it actually is. Yeah. Good. Good. And um, before that, though, you wrote uh, your life story. You wrote about Ghost in the Wires. And Correct. Uh, Bill Simon and I. Bill Simon was uh, uh, worked on the project uh, and did a lot of the uh, you know heavy lifting on the writing. But uh, there are so many versions of my story out there that it was very it was really important to me to get the more accurate and completely accurate story. So it's it's kind of like a catch me if you can, right. but of the computer age rather than you know writing bad checks. Right. And in that, you uh, talked about going undercover. Uh, well, I went were... undercover. I was a fugitive. Exactly. So, so I had to get off the grid. I had to go underground. and um, Set the time. Uh, Mid-1990s, right? And uh, I had, uh, there was an informant that was working with the federal government to essentially put me back in jail. And uh, so at one time, at, at one point in time in the story, I learned that there was a, a warrant for my arrest for violating my probation. So I decided, hey, I'm just going to get off the grid and worry about it later. So I had to create new identities, cover stories. I had to develop comms with my uh, family that would be a, very secure and some of my you know, friends that I'd associate with, uh, you know, and I had a, you know, I worked legitimate jobs, right? right. So I had to, you know, obviously set up the background in such a way that they were verifiable jobs, verifiable, verifiable uh, degrees, and this sort of thing. And I kind of like lived undercover. So I worked legitimate jobs during the day, and then I was a hacker by night, hacker for the hobby. Right. In other words, breaking into systems really for the challenge, not to earn a profit. So that was back in the 80s, No, 90s. that was 90s. That was 90s. 90s. Correct. Pre-internet to some degree. Correct. We and didn't, you know, it was, you know, you're right. It was a, pretty much the only internet site that I remember at that time was JPL. So you right. can go look at the, you know, you go look at Mars. Right. That was pretty much it. Right. So flash forward to near term, recent memory. You've got Ross Ulbrich. You've got people creating like Silk Road and whatnot, but in the internet age. How hard is it then to create a, a, a dual persona? He tried to create Dead Pirate Roberts, but at some point put his legitimate Gmail address in Cor there. Correct. I mean, he was sloppy with his operations. And, and people usually do this in the beginning. Not only he used his own email address kind of to advertise Silk Road in the beginning, but also he obtained false identities mm -hmm. and he was living under an alias name at some, in, in San Francisco but the fake IDs were actually going to the home he was living in, which is crazy because, you know, you want to separate yourself completely. So I'm really wondering why he didn't use a mail drop, right? right? Because you can get a mail drop without, you know, using identification. They do require it, but there's always a uh, pretext. You could, let's say you lost your wallet, you're waiting for um, your birth certificate to come. And there's always exceptions that a lot of these mail services will use, especially ones that aren't corporate like UPS and mailboxes, et cetera. Right. So we talk about that in Art of Invisibility. Part right. of the idea was how do you get offline in an internet age? And it's really tough. If you really want to be invisible from law enforcement or an intelligence agency, you have to go to the nth degree and be very meticulous um, about your communication security. And almost like being here at the DEF CON slash Black Hat conference, you kind of have to be the same because recently, there is a bug in the broad, Broadcom chipset that was discovered by a security researcher that is actually going to be presenting a talk on it here at Black Hat. So you have to wonder who else has figured out this exploit. And it doesn't require that you do anything. It's just simply if your Wi-Fi is turned on your Android or your iOS device, you're exploitable. So in this type of environment, you have to be really careful about what you decide to bring uh, into the conference and what technologies you use. Like, you know, well, maybe I'll bring my iPhone, and but I won't use Wi-Fi, or won't use Bluetooth, I'll just make calls. Of course, there are other types of exploits where people could intercept your, your communications, mm. like using kind of like what law enforcement uses, a Stingray, right? It's kind of like what we call an MC catcher type of device. So there's always that type of threat, 
Um, so the real question is, is are you trying to protect the, your, your security or your anonymity? So if it's really your security, even uh, rather than you know, being anonymous, then on your device, you could use you know, like a voice over IP app, like Signal, for example, to protect the, the secrecy of your communications. And it does so by? It does so by using end-to-end -end encryption. Right, end-to-end -end being the important at, at, part. At, at each endpoint. So right. if we're using Signal, you have your key, I have my key. And no one in the middle. And nobody in the middle. But if you have sophisticated researchers like we have here at Black Hat, the best in the world, what if there is an iOS exploit where they can gain access to the endpoint, compromise the endpoint, and extract the key? That's what we have to be worried about. That's kind of how law enforcement and intel agencies work, is they don't try to compromise the communications on the network side, they go after the endpoint. Like Eternal Blue? Well, Eternal Blue was an exploit uh, that was used on the Windows operating system. Correct. Right, uh, right, that exploited a vulnerability in SMB. But it allowed remote access yeah, to so, that Windows environment. So if you had a key on a Windows device, then a key that was you know, used in end-to-end -end encryption, that could, then that could be actually pilfered right. by the attacker. Right. right. So you have to think about when you're using end-to-end -end encryption, it's not the end-all and be-all, unless you could really protect the endpoints. And we were dealing with law enforcement, nation states, black hat researchers, you have to think about can you really protect that endpoint? Right. Right. So I prefer like like when I'm in the when I'm in the hotels here, I really don't I, I actually bring my own hotspot. I I kind of use it away from everybody else, you know, uh, where I'm kind of out of range and I try not to use my computer like in front of people where I'm using my my hotspot. Like when I'm in like I'm taking a class, my friend's teaching a class here at Black Hat, is I'm using their network, but I'm not connecting any, I just have a local VM and I'm only using their network to connect to their infrastructure. Right. I'm not logging into my email, I'm not logging on to conduct business because you know here we're dealing with such a, such a substantial threat. Right, any yeah. other tips that you would offer? I mean, consider, consider getting a burner device, but let's say you go get a burner device and then, so nobody knows that this device belongs to uh, Rob Vermosi or Kevin Mitnick, but then somebody is able to compromise that device by using some unknown exploit. So now when you log on to your email or do whatever you do on that device, it could be intercepted. Then the anonymity is breached. Right. So um, how we, what we talk about in Art of Invisibility to have really uh, the level of privacy that a privacy activist would want, we talk about using burner type of devices, but a way of acquiring that device, of doing it in a secure way of where I'm not gonna be on camera buying a phone or buying an internet hotspot, or buying a SIM card, or topping up data. Um, we talk about essentially trying to put cutouts in front of that. Right. But more importantly, when we're using the device, we're away from work, friends, school. You know, We don't have our other uh, devices with us that are using cellular. Those devices are somewhere else. So, you know, that, so the anonymity of obtaining the device and where you're using the device makes it harder for an attacker to compromise you. Right. but not impossible, right? Right, and one of the things that resonated with me when you brought it up in the book was when you buy a burner laptop, don't power it on in your home network or your right. work network because well, as soon I'm as you do... About, yeah, what I'm concerned about, let's say you're, you're being monitored by whatever threat actor and uh, you power up a device and it has a Wi-Fi a NIC card, uh, well, the local network uh, gets the MAC address, right? right. And maybe the internet service providers like Time Warner, Cox, maybe somehow that's logged because a lot of those providers have access to your, to your internal infrastructure in a lot of cases. So I always wonder, because this would be a great thing for law enforcement and intel agencies, if they have a target's MAC address, that's the real MAC address that was used in that hardware, can they somehow trace that MAC address to a particular computer and then trace that purchase to an individual? Because if I was the NSA, I would do that. I would somehow, you know, s set it up because they're not, maybe they're random at the manufacturer, but maybe in some cases the manufacturer keeps track. So if you buy these cards from China and Apple puts them into their MacBooks, are they saying, okay, this NIC card with this Mac address went into this MacBook with this serial number. Right. Now, someone goes to the store, orders a MacBook, whatever. Now you have serial number tracked to, to buyer. So... 
you have to always think about how can you potentially be tracked. It's really, again, a, a complex and meticulous operation to maintain privacy today because it's so easy for a threat actor to breach your anonymity and breach your communications. Right, and that's one thing we do talk about in the book is changing your mindset. And right. Just thinking of all the different ways that you're leaving evidence, leaving fingerprints, right. leaving something that could trace back to you if that's something that is of a concern to you. Because right. it's not just terrorists. As you said, there are also rights activists. There are legitimate reasons. You bring so, up yes, the voice exactly. lawyers a lot. In, in no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking like when I'm thinking about it, evading intelligence agencies, I'm thinking more like a Julian Assange you know, type of character. But not all of us are in that position. Yeah. Right. So not everyone's going to Black Hat, DEF CON. Not everybody's concerned about law enforcement or an uh, intelligence agency. So then your level of security requirements are much lower, and that's where you have different sets of privacy protections that are good enough for your purposes. Right. Right, and maybe using Signal, maybe not even having to get a burner phone, maybe just when you have, need to have a confidential conversation with a business partner, you're using Signal. If you're discussing something that's you know, critically important to the business. Then you're not worried about anonymity, but you're more concerned about protecting the proprietary information of the business. Right. Well, on that note, I thank you, Kevin, okay. for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. All right. And by the way, Rob did uh, a, a lot, a, I mean, a lot of awesome work on that book. Well, thank so, you, Kevin. Appreciate right. it. All right. Take care. All right. Okay, we're All out. Right.